53回東京国際交流館国際塾にご参加いただきまして誠にありがとうございます開会の前に連絡がございます本イベントは同時通訳で実施するため2つの YouTube チャンネルにて放送いたします TIEC&HIH チャンネルは英語 TIEC&HIH チャンネル2は日本語ですそれぞれのチャンネルへのリンクは概要欄に記載しております本チャンネルは日本語です別言語での視聴を希望される方はご参照くださいそれではこれより第53回東京国際交流館国際塾を開催いたします開会に先立ちまして日本学生支援機構留学生事業部長の丸山啓二よりご挨拶申し上げます丸山部長よろしくお願いいたしますみなさんこんにちは日本学生支援機構留学生事業部長の丸山と申します本日は第53回東京国際交流館国際塾にご参加いただき誠にありがとうございます国際塾は日本のさまざまな分野の第一線で活躍されている専門家を講師としてお招きしお話を聞くことで日本に対する多角的な理解を深める機会を提供することを目的としています新型コロナウイルス感染症感染防止対策のため残念ながらオンラインでの開催となりましたさて53回目を迎える今回の国際塾のテーマは「侍」です This is the 53rd session, and today's theme is Samurai. And、uh, this theme is very popular among the foreigners、uh, associated with Japan. And we, when we did survey, Samurai also ranked high, and、uh, we know that、uh, it, this is a very popular theme. So I know that、uh, there are many people who have been looking forward to this session. Today, we invited、uh, Mr. Owada as one of the lecturers who has an ancestor of a samurai and a well known historian, particularly about the、uh, warring st states period. And his father is also a very well known historian. He's following his step. And second guest is.、Uh, Founder of、uh, International Samurai Association and also a descendant of、uh, Ichin School, Japanese Harvard, and、uh, Ran Ebisawa san. And today we invited、uh, two prominent figures in、uh, the samurai code or the war stadium period. I hope that、uh, you will find this session very productive and informative. And a good opportunity to learn about the history of Japan and the, the spirit of samurai. With that, I'd like to conclude my opening remark. Thank you very much. Mr. Mariyama, thank you very much. And today's theme is the samurai. And、uh, the, we invited two guests. Known for writing books or uh, uh, the giving lecture on TV, Mr. Owada, and、uh, has a long family history of、uh, samurai family line, Ebisawa, Miss Rand Ebisawa. And thank you very much for joining the session out of very busy schedule. And this event consists of four sessions. First session is an outline of samurai beginning and end. Second part is、uh, the battle manner and tactics and armor, sword, and so on. And section three is from、uh, Ebisawa san and、uh, the, how to utilize the wisdom of the samurai to live today. And、uh, the fourth part is a live performance of、uh, the Japanese. Halberd by、uh, Miss Ebisawa. 
and you have a chance to post your comments or questions using our YouTube chat function. So now I'd like to hand over to Mr. O Omada to start his first part, Outline of Samurai History, from the beginning to the end. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. My name is Yasutsune Owada, and today I'd like to first talk about the overview of samurai history. And to begin with, what is samurai about? And samurai is uh, the alternative name for bushi. But originally, samurai was uh, middle class or aristocrats, meaning that uh, aristocrats used their martial arts and served the imperial court. That was uh, the original samurai concept. And uh, the origin of the word samurai is to serve the upper class aristocrats. And uh, in Japanese, it was called uh, saburau and uh, transform into samurai, as you know. And uh, as you can see from the origin of the word, samurai original concept is to serve the Lord or someone higher than higher in the hierarchy. And uh, in terms of the imperial court of that time, of course, uh, we still have the sitting emperor but at this age, in ancient times in Japan, the imperial court was ruling the, or governing the country, and the uh, emperor was at the top of the imperial court. Under the uh, emperor, the aristocrats were doing the administrative tasks, and uh, they had a hierarchy from upper class, middle class, lower class. But basically, in the case of Japan, the upper aristocrats dominating all the key roles in the government or imperial court. Uh, and uh, that was a major reason why the in imperial court uh, governance uh, deteriorated. And uh, you may have been to Kyoto, but uh, in the ancient time, uh, Japan's capital was in Kyoto. Uh, currently, it's in Tokyo, but uh, it used to be in Kyoto. And that's where the imperial court located. And there were 68 countries within Japan and governed and by the local government, who are uh, mainly middle class aristocrats. And it is an equivalent of uh, the local governor of today, what the difference is that uh, they are democrat democratically elected. But uh, in the ancient times, those local governors were uh, appointed by the inter imperial court. So it was a very centralized ruling then. And the middle class aristocrats or lower class aristocrats were deployed to local uh, government. And why upper-class aristocrats stayed in Kyoto is because uh, they enjoyed the privilege to stay there and assume the central roles. So if there is a battle somewhere in Japan, then the local government uh, mobilized the uh, warriors. And those military section was governed by Bukan, who was uh, working in the central government. So there were um, the political side and the military side of the government. So if there is a major uprise in Japan, then the military commander or military officials are deployed from Kyoto to subdue the uprights, 
but it was not sustainable because the imperial court authority deteriorated over time and uh, not capable to perform the military, perf uh, military duties. Because uh, it used to be the case that imperial court could mobilize the warriors, but because their authority or military capability deteriorated and they became like a uh, they lost their capability to perform the military duties. So what happened when there was an uprising in Japan, then uh, there came samurai. And what's the difference between the bukan and samurai, or military official? So samurai is not belonging to the imperial court. Samurai originally the ancestor of imperial, but uh, they utilize uh, their military capability to serve the imperial court. So it's like a private soldier for to serve the imperial court, whereas uh, Bukan uh, directly employed by the imperial court. So samurai was not an official employee of the imperial court, and they were serving to the upper class aristocrats who are employed by the imperial court. As you can tell from the origin of the word samurai, and samurai originally served the upper class aristocrats, and upper class aristocrats dominated the key roles in the central government. So the middle class aristocrats have to go out of the Kyoto and had to find their own uh, place in the local areas. So anyway, Kokushi is an official employee of the imperial court. And under the order from the central or imperial court, they were deployed to the local governments, but even their uh, position was expired, they didn't go back to Kyoto and stayed in their local place. So the difference between samurai and bushi is that uh, they, today it is regarded as the same thing, but originally samurai was referring to the middle class aristocrats who served the upper class aristocrats, whereas uh, bushi used to be the landlord who militarized themselves to protect their properties. So. Bushi had their own power, exerted their power in local area, but the samurai was uh, deployed from, a samurai was ordered to go to the local areas to govern those areas. And the samurai has an origin in aristocracy, and samurai became the leader of the Bushi group because uh, they have a higher uh, social status as aristocrats. And currently, or today, samurai and bushi are regarded as the same thing, but uh, samurai and bushi has a different history, because samurai is, uh, has a right, the authority as a cavalry warrior. So samurai is a part of a kind of bushi, but has a special privilege to wage in a war on a horse. So in other words, it's a top hierarchy, top of the hierarchy, because uh, the warriors then were riding on a horse when they were fighting, but if you don't have that privilege, then they have to fight on the ground. And uh, Bushi also 
Bushi was included in warrior, but uh, they didn't have that privilege to ride a horse while they are battling or combating. So samurai was under the control or authority of the imperial court, but the, towards the end of the ancient era, then the samurai exerted its military power to intervene the power struggle at the imperial court because the imperial court lost the capability to mobilize the military forces and they needed the help from samurai. And because of that, the samurai uh, increased their presence in the imperial Paris. So in the medieval era of Japan, samurai who subdued the uprising in Japan uh, founded the feudal government, Bakufu. And uh, later in the year, Bakufu uh, overwhelmed the imperial court and uh, took the rule of Japan, while the imperial court only maintained its authority but lost the power to govern. And the top of the samurai is the shogun, and the samurai who became a shogun set up the feudal government, which is Bakufu, and ruled the country. And shogun, what is shogun? Originally, uh, descendants of samurai who were active in Japanese ancient times were the only one who had the right to become shogun. What do I mean by that? As I've been saying, samurai, um, um, they were the mi middle um, aristocrats, uh, middle-ranking aristocrats. And the descendants were proud of that ranking. And their ancestors were aristocrats. So they believed that they were able to have the right or status in the imperial court. So. In Japan, it is uh, called Great Generals, or Sei Itai Shogun in Japanese, and Imperial Court assign or uh, appoint the Shogun. And this is the difficulty in Japanese history. But the top is the Imperial Court. And the Imperial Court, at the very top of the Imperial Court, it's the Japanese Emperor who is, the, uh, who is re ruling the country, but the imperial court does not have military strength, and that part is left in the hands of shogun, and shogun is a top of samurais. So practically speaking, after the medieval Japan, Japanese politi uh, politics were uh, driven by shogun, and the uh, bakufu or shogunate, this uh, great general, uh, when uh, they go into the battle, then uh, they will um, have troops headquarters, and that originally meant uh, the uh, back before, um, but in the Jap uh, early modern times in Japan, from 17th to 19th, Shogun, uh, its name has changed to Tycoon for external, uh, uh, that's external meeting. It, Shogun uh, leads a troop, and if you use the word shogun uh, in overseas, that is not well understood. That is why for the uh, early modern times in Japan, uh, externally, uh, uh, shogun was referred to as tycoon, and this tycoon in, in, uh, tycoon in Japanese uh, is the origin of the English word tycoon. So on the top of the samurai uh, established the government or shogunate, and the samurai government or shogunate. Um, shogun originally is the head of the samurai group, meaning he um, uh, shogun was uh, new to the politics. So in early medieval Japan, realistically, uh, aristocrats were invited to uh, govern the political issues and the samurai learn from the aristocrats, but as uh, eventually a samurai government or shogunate was um, uh, shogunate um, was formed, 
as a ruling system. And during the pre-modern period, aristocrats no longer had to be involved in the politics and samurai completely took firm control of political and military affairs, being in con uh, complete control of Japan. And so samurai uh, started to serve the double purpose of civil vassals and military officials. And this was a very big uh, change in the Japanese history because um, before this, um, the civil vassals and military officials belonged to the imperial court. But in the uh, early modern times, samurai started to serve both as civil vassals and military officials. So. Bushi has military and political power both. And before, politics were done by the imperial court and only the military uh, uh, affairs were to, um, taken care of by Bushi. But in the early modern times, uh, samurai started to be uh, both in charge of civil, uh, military and political affairs, and this was a very big milestone in Japanese history. And in the early modern times, so again, Bushi both serves as civil vassals and military officials. In ancient times, Bushi only had to do the military, uh, t um, only had to take care of the military affairs, and civil uh, vassals only had to take care of the political vassals. I think the same goes to China, but the roles were totally um, separated before. But how is it different in case of Japan? Bushi uh, serves both as civil vassals and military officials, which means that cultural appreciation or cultivation was needed very much. And of course, uh, they originally were Bushi, meaning that um, they, are, they served through their martial arts. That is why the classical Japanese martial arts were essential for samurai, they must learn. Uh, the martial arts. And also, ideally, um, they need to accomplish in both the literacy, uh, sorry, literary and mar military arts. Both literary and military arts have to be learned by samurai. And not only military arts, but literary was also important. So they learned uh, Waka poetry or no play and tea ceremony. Waka poetry is a traditional culture in Japan. It has a style of 5757, and this is a poetry, traditional poetry in Japan. And no gaku or no play and tea ceremony, those were also learned by samurai as they were. Uh, needed for them, not just uh, military p power, but they also had to have cultural appreciation. So they learned uh, different cultures and they um, also grew as high ranking culture figures and of summarize. Um, um, there was a samurai who started a school of tea ceremony, and also there were samurai um, who also played in uh, no gaku or no play. So, same goes for waka poetry. So, they have started to be recognized as high ranking cultural figures. So, samurai had to learn. And of course, martial arts are very important because they are bushy. They must have, uh, they must um, know martial arts. But when it comes to martial arts or martial traditions, there are different kinds. As you can see here, sword play, spear play, stick play, fight using a stick. And also gunnery, a cannon, archery, boss and arrows and wrestling, grappling play. Uh, this still remains as judo, but more practical judo was referred to as wrestling, grappling play. So combat does not always mean that uh, warriors have, oh, they are armed. Sometimes unarmed, they do uh, engage in wrestling or grappling. 
and then uh, wrestling grappling play became judo as a sport and also extreme art and I said that um, they are the one who fight on horseback so they have to be able to ride a horse and not just uh, mastering riding a horse but also they have to draw katana or they have to have a spear and fight while on the um, horseback and when they are engaging grappling on horseback and they may fall from the horse and then they may they, then the one who um, falls would be defeated. So um, anyway, those uh, martial traditions were uh, learned by samurais, and it's called Buge Johapan, or 18 classical Japanese martial tra traditions. And those are the skills, martial art skills, that the bushi had to learn. And of course, this kind of martial traditions still remain. And at the uh, current or presently, they became sports as Japanese classical martial arts. But people back um, at the time, they didn't do those as a sport. They were needed for them to survive. But pre presently, it became um, sports. But at the time, they were uh, needed a samurai struggle for life. And samurai appearance, their appearance was um, very different than the commoners. And from the look, anyone can tell, oh, he is a samurai. There were two characteristics of samurai. One is um, they had two swords, long and short one. And also a samurai had a top knot. And what do I mean by uh, two swords? Uh, or in other words, daisho nihonbashi. And daisho nihonbashi meaning wearing two swords. They wear two swords, long sword and short one. And daito means long sw sword. In so uh, Bushi had um, two swords hanging on their waist. Probably it's hard to um, imagine right now, but samurai at the time always had those two swords on their waist. Why two swords? The usage is different depending on the length. So long sword is needed to keep distance from the opponent and the wakizashi or um, short sword. When you are in a close combat, then you would use the wakizashi or short sword. That's why samurai had two swords on the waist. And in the early modern times in Japan, samurai were the only one wearing swords, but commoners Yes, they do kind of uh, carry swords or wear swords, but they were not able to um, uh, wear them in public. It was only samurai who would wear swords on their waist in public. So if someone um, wears two swords, you can at a gl uh, glance tell he is a samurai. But if some, if uh, you wear two swords, um, on your waist and walk around, it could be dangerous. Someone could draw the katana from you and you may be attacked. That is why when they are invited as a guest or when they serve for their duty, they will leave a long sword. And also if a samurai wears um, the long sword or daito, people could be scared that uh, you may attack them. But uh, even so, you will still be wearing short sword. So samurai would always have a sword and they are ready to draw sword anytime. So that it was the psychological condition of the samurai. So if anything happens, Uchigatana long sword and Wakizashi short sword, they would use one of the two swords to counterattack. And this daisho ni hondashi, or wearing two swords, uh, means that a samurai was always ready to fight or counterattack. And also, if you've seen the um, period drama in Japan, You may have seen these top knots, but these top knots. So top knots means that the top of the head is shaved and remaining hair was tied into a top knot. Why do they do that? 
during battles, uh, they wear kabuto or helmet. I'm not wearing it right now, but the official uh, style of samurai is to have helmet on. But uh, when they um, have helmet or kabuto on, then um, if you have um, hairs at the top of your head, it could be sweaty. And when you move during the battle, that um, then during the battle, this uh, kabuto or helmet, because of the hair, may um, not stay, may move. That is why samurai used to uh, shave their hair. And in Japan, Presently, uh, uh, you probably wouldn't really see anyone who on, uh, sh is shaving only the top of the head. And well, I actually know someone who um, is shaving only the top part of the head uh, to present himself like samurai. But and this top knot in Japanese is called chomage or mage. But and uh, during the battle, uh, they will um, untie the top knot to, so that they can wear kabuto. And originally, these top knots were used only during the time of battle. But uh, during the um, Warring States period, uh, it was common that uh, uh, samurai always rent their top knots during the pre-modern period. So after the 16th uh, century, samurai would normally always arrange their top knots. And this continued until uh, the 19th century, uh, the early modern times in Japan. So shave the head and um, um, put uh, the remaining hair into a top knot. And if you see someone uh, with the top knots, you can tell this person is samurai. Why they need such a symbolic appearance? It's because to uh, show off their privilege and authority. In the pre-modern period of Japan, they are at the top of the hierarchy and they were the ruling class. So they had other privilege according to their hierarchy, and one of the authority or privilege they had is the kiris de gomen. What it means is that a uh, privilege of samurai to kill ordinary people because of a perceived affront to the code of samurai, and uh, they were acquitted if uh, it is perceived that the ordinary people uh, humiliated or did something impolite to samurai and their pride has been if they are, if it was proved that their um pride was severely injured then it was okay for samurai to kill ordinary people uh, one reason is to maintain the class or the authority of the samurai but of course uh, there was a certain discipline and although granted with this privilege, it was very rare that in reality that this was used by samurai. And uh, of course, a samurai was disciplined and cannot abuse this privilege. And they had to prove that their privilege or the authority was severely injured. Otherwise, they were the ones uh, to be punished. And if it was proved, or if it, it was not, it turned out to be an abuse, then they might have been executed. So they really had to be very, very careful and disciplined if they want to uh, make use of this privilege. There need to be a justification with a legitimate reason. And uh, Bushido is the code of a samurai. You may have heard Bushido, the term, the way of samurai, or the ethics of samurai. They were living by this Bushido, but if it goes against uh, the samurai code, and if 
it was proved that uh, the samurai abused this kiriste gomen privilege, then uh, the samurai was punished. Now let me explain what is the code of the samurai, Bushido. And uh, there was a person, Inazo Nitobe, who wrote about the Bushido. And uh, that was the beginning that people uh, widely recognize what Bushido is. So this is not something like a legal framework, but this is more like an ethics of samurai. So or legal or illegal, it's nothing to do with this. This is more like a morale, ethics for samurai. If it's uh, appropriate for samurai or not is the core of this concept. And in the pre-modern period, they became the ruling class of Japan. So it was even more important to see themselves as a ruling class person if they are following the uh, code or if they are conscious of the ethics was very important. And uh, samurai also adopted uh, Confucian ideas as a part of the ethics or moral ethics of samurai and adopted or incorporated into Bushido and there are three main areas of uh, Bushido. The absolute obedience and loyalty for one's master are the basic idea. And uh, one's master means like a boss or a supervisor of a samurai. So they have to show the absolute obedience and loyalty to their masters. And all the samurai was adhering to that idea. And this is for their masters, their attitude towards master. But uh, each individual of a samurai have to become a disciplined and a decent uh, leader with uh, politeness, honor, and honesty or modesty and the spirit of self-sacrifice to follow the code of the samurai Bushido by risking one's life. This is probably the one of the most important idea to show their royalty in obedience by sacrificing themselves. And one very well-known episode is harakiri, so-called berry cutting. And the origin of harakiri is a traditional method of a suicide of samurai. But actually, the history goes back to ancient era. Why do they do this, this belly cutting? Why it has to be this way? Because uh, one thing is a tradition or traditional concept that a human spirit resides in belly and uh, it was regarded as the ideal way to commit suicide to cut belly because there is a spirit and it's a respectful way of dying for samurai but of course this is banned in the modern days but you know the very well-known author Yukio Mishima did committed suicide by cutting his belly, even it was banned and uh, illegal. So this has some um, emotional value to Japanese people because of this legacy, but of course this is uh, illegal, so we are not allowed to do this anymore. And why? Did they need to do harakiri? There are three main reasons. One is uh, oibara, to show the loyalty when one's lord died. Because they, if the uh, one's lord died, then uh, there's no one to show their loyalty. 
So if there is no law, then no meaning for the samurai who is under that law to con continue to live. Or the second case is tsumebara, to take responsibility of the failure, like uh, uh, if they uh, lost in the battle or did something wrong in duties. And uh, this tsumebara, the word is still used in modern Japan, meaning to take responsibility of the failure. And of course, it's just a literary mean. It doesn't literally mean to cut belly. Just the word has been inherited. But uh, at that time, tsumebara actually mean to cut belly, to take responsibility. In modern days, it's more like uh, to leave the company or resign the diet member step step down is a modern way of tsumebara. And number three is uh, to prove one's innocence with death, which is called munebara. Munebara. So if someone is subject to the execution, but uh, in order to prove one's innocence, even though one's life is taken, then uh, they did harakiri to prove one's innocence with death. So in short, harakiri is uh, execution, or, oh, sorry, um, Seppuku or harakiri is mainly used for suicide, but uh, it was also an alternative way to execute or death penalty because uh, beheading is a way of execution for ordinary people, but the samurai was a privileged class and uh, allowed to do harakiri. So, of course, uh, both die. As a result, uh, samurai dies, whether it's uh, beheaded or uh, harakiri. And the beheaded is uh, killed by someone, but uh, seppuku is a suicide and regarded as a privilege or honorable way to die. That's how samurai regarded as uh, Harakiri and beheading means that uh, the one beheaded is regarded as a criminal, but uh, haraki, if it's a harakiri, suicide, then uh, the person is not regarded as a criminal, but it's a like, suicide. And towards the end of a pre-modern era, a samurai or the feudal Lord governing the country, and into the 19th and 20th century, uh, in the status as samurai is lost by the introduction of the conscription system. And the conscription system was administered by the government, not the samurai government. And those who conscripted are civil civilians, and uh, samurai is no longer needed with this. But of course, if they lost their status, then I might lead to uh, the insurrection or uprise. So they were granted the new status of samurai descendants. So the status of samurai turns into samurai descendants, which is called shizoku. But it doesn't give you any money, or it's just a title without any substantial value. And for samurai, carrying swords became banned, and uh, having a haircut became free by the order. So they didn't need to keep the top knot style. That was a symbolic hairstyle for samurai. And actually it was banned 
So the swords and top knots were the symbols of samurai or his, their class, but those were banned and uh, their appearance became s the same or similar to the civilians or ordinary people. This was another uh, milestone uh, indicating the end of samurai, but in the modern Japan government, those uh, samurai descendants or shizoku were at the center of the new government in the modern era. And the difference is that they became the, they were employed as bureaucrats, as a core members of the government, but actually they were also shizoku who were samurai descendants, but uh, samurai lost its meaning. And that is the difference between uh, samurai and shizoku. But uh, samurai knows have know-how of politics and also the they have, uh, they are very versed, very well versed in uh, various cultures as well. And uh, they could, they couldn't find any people who are very vast in uh, the cultural aspect as samurai, so that is why they became the central figure of the government. So Shizoku became politicians or became the company leader or, or teachers in academia to uh, transfer their knowledge to the next generations. But in among Shizoku, some became a politician and uh, became a central figure of the government or the corporate leaders, meaning that uh, they were success they successfully changed their jobs, but some couldn't because uh, only a limited number of uh, Shizoku uh, took the position at the government or the uh, corporations. And those who were employed by the government were the ones who supported the foundation of the new government. But uh, there were many uh, shizoku or samurai descendants who couldn't find jobs under the new rule. And uh, they did uprise because of dissatisfaction after the uh, uh, authority or privilege was deprived and uh, they became very poor uh, with no job, whereas in the past their status was secured and uh, they were able to earn the salary on a regular basis, but because of the government change or regime change, they lost their status and lost everything, including the income and the social status and everything. And uh, those dissatisfaction led to the uprise, like uh, depicted in Last Samurai, the film. And uh, literally, it was the depiction of the last samurai the last uprise of samurai, uh, dissatisfied samurai under the new regime. Of course, it's a fiction, but uh, based on a fact. There were uh, uprise by the dissatisfied, dissatisfied samurai, but uh, once those uprise subdued, then uh, virtually all sam our samurai really ended. The era of samurai really ended. So Shizoku term had been maintained, and uh, they were proudly said that I'm a Shizoku, but uh, once the uh, current constitution came into force, then uh, Shizoku was uh, official title before that uh, modern constitution. Then they were able to use that title in the social activities. But uh, under the modern constitution, that was disappeared, and uh, they were not no longer able to use as a social title. So, 
there's no samurai existing in the present Japan. How whatever so and there's no class of samurai in Japan anymore. But after modern times, the former Shizoku or samurai descendants became politicians, they work as government bureaucrats or businessmen or teacher in schools. Then um the the sphere of influence will still be there for the next generation. It, they're not ex completely exclu excluded from the world. So former samurai still played a pivotal role. So the spirit of the Bushido or the code of the samurai was maintained and passed on to the next generation. And that is why politeness, honor, honesty, simplicity, those are what samurai valued. This idea of Bushido or the code of samurai still remains in the present. The um, There's no samurai or the, we don't have a class of samurai anymore, but uh, we still have people who, who inherited the spirit of samurai. And I'm sure that will continue for the generations to come as well. So that was a quick introduction of the samurai from its origins to the end. And if you have any question, I would like to uh, take your questions now. Uh, thank you, Mr. Awada, and I would like to take questions. And if you have any questions, please post your questions into the chat box of YouTube. I think we have one question coming in. Samurai and ninja, what are the difference of the two? Well, samurai, as I explained again uh, earlier, um, samurai is bushi, but ninja is like a spy or espionage who will steal information. But they're different. But ninja serves to uh, samurai, so they work under samurai. And ninja uh, work for samurai, get or steal information. Thank you for answering. Any other question? Then I have one question, if I may. In Japan, TV, movies, uh, we have period dramas, and samurai is very popular in those programs. And samurai, from the were they popular among the commoners at the time? Well, commoners, ordinary people, they, I don't think they were popular among the ordinary people. It's like it's and the same as the current bureaucrats or politicians. Do you think the current politicians and bureaucrats are loved by the ordinary people? It's hard to say. Well, I, so I think samurai was not loved by the ordinary people. Thank you. I, and there's another question. So samurai is gone, but the spirit of samurai still survive. Why is that? Yes, as I said at the end, in the end, the original samurais, they played a pivotal role in the society. So their thinking, I think, disseminated across the nation, across Japan, especially many of them worked as teachers in schools. So ed ed as education, that spirit was passed on to their children and grandchildren. So I think the education played a, a big role. Thank you. One more question from my side. So samurai, uh, is that, um, um, th th was there hereditary system for samurai? Was it possible for a commoner to become samurai? Basically hereditary system, but if, you have high competence, you may be recruited. But in the uh, early modern times in Japan, if you have money, you could be samurai. So it became a matter of money. Thank you. Any other question? I think uh, we do not have any other question in the chat box. So, Mr. Owada, thank you very much for the great presentation. With that, I would like to close the first part of the seminar and take a 10-minute break. And uh, next from 4.10, Mr. Owada will come back to the stage for part two, the battle manners, tactics, armors, and swords. And everyone, please stay on this channel. Thank you.
So it's ten past four. Welcome back. And uh, now we'll start with the part two, the battle manners, tactics, armors and swords by Wada san. So Wada san over to you. So let me continue from here. Thank you for joining me back. And as introduced, I would like to talk about the battle manners, tactics, armors, etc. And swords. And first of all, battles. Samurai battles, how were they uh, fighting? Mainly there are two types, siege and fit battles. But this is not uh, unique to Japan, but in case of Japan, mainly siege and field battle. Those were two uh, big forms of battles or tactics. So for siege, it's about attacking a castle. That's the siege. And both um, the armies and the enemies, two armies collide with each other in fields and mountains, and that's the field battle. And so attacking a castle, siege battle, how did the armies fight? So in case of castle, the, uh, the uh, side holding a castle is advantageous in case of siege battle. So in Japan, um, while the army hold a castle, then uh, reinforcements or rear guard could be sent. And just because uh, you are attacked in a castle, it doesn't mean that you will lose. It was uh, quite also uh, natural common, excuse me, it was um, also common to win the battle when you um, hold the castle. And uh, uh, the the trip length strip trip strength needed it was very different, and um, attacking force will need to have three times more trip strength. Otherwise, the casualty could be also large. But if reinforcement reinforcements or re rear guard were sent, then uh, they may not be able to win. And attacking castle, it may take it will take time, and they may not succeed. That's why uh, attacking force may uh, intentionally lure enemies out from the castle, and that's a, the tactic is called karita or harvesting rice fields. So rice fields around the castle are harvested because to stop that from the castles, soldiers will come up from the castle. And then the attacking force may take that opportunity to uh, invade into the castle. So, castles. I think some of you have visited uh, uh, castles in Japan, but samurai lived in a place called Goten or Castle Palace. That's where samurai lived. And uh, for Japanese castles, there's a, a building called Tenshu, or Castle Tower, which is a symbol of a castle, but in reality, that's not the place for samurai to live on a daily basis. But this Tenshu, or Castle Tower, uh, uh, was um, use, um, uh, used as a fort at the time of siege. And in case of Japan, uh, we have 2.6 million years without any wars. And then there's no need to keep castle tower for battles. That is why in the pre-modern Japan, this Tenshu or a castle tower uh, started to be used as a warehouse. And this is the picture of Kochi Castle in uh, Kochi Prefecture in Shikoku. And as you can see, Yes, this one here, this tall tower is called Tenshu or Castle Tower, and this one is called Goten or Castle Palace. So if enemy attacks the castle, then from here, um, the guard will watch for the enemies. But this Goten is a place where samurai on, not every, uh, on a daily basis lived. So building. This is where samurai lived. And when attacking force uh, try uh, or uh, attacks 
the castle. Then, if the enemy invades this uh, castle palace, samurai had a mission to fight till the end, try, try to protect the castle. And castles. In case of Japanese castles, depending on the location, there are three types of castles. So first, uh, Hirajiro or flat, uh, flatland castle, which is built on a plain. A hill castle, which is built on hills. And mountain castle is the one built on mountains. The three types. And flatland castle or Hirajiro, uh, this is an example uh, of flatland castle, Matsumoto Castle in Nagano. And as you can see, it's completely a flatland castle. So that's the definition of the uh, Hirajiro or Flatland Castle. For it was easier to govern from political point of view. And it's, this one is Hill Castle. Uh, the a castle is built on a, a hill and probably 30 to 50 meters high. So this is the Himeji Castle from Hyogo, uh, which was registered at World Heritage. You may have been there. And this, the type is Hill Castle. And this is Gifu Castle from Gifu Prefecture. And as you can see, this is where the castle was built. The height of about 300 meters. Quite a, uh, quite a mountain. And you can take a, a ropeway cable car. And thanks to the civilization, you can go to the top in a minute or so. But people at the time spent a few hours to climb up. And the uh, castle was built on top of the mountains. And the mountain itself um, it, uh, was difficult to attack because there's natural protection. And how the they defend a castle. In case of Japan, a uh, building uh, was built on top of stone walls, and there are Tenshiro Castle Tower or Yagura Turret or Watchtower from those buildings. They will attack the attacking enemies. And this is a picture of Himeji Castle's Tenshiro Castle Tower, a small one and big one. So this is a smaller. Uh, Tenshu. The stone walls are built almost uh, vertically. Uh, that is why it's difficult for enemies to climb up and attack. And this is a Tenshu of uh, Matsumoto Castle in Nagano, a very grand uh, Tenshu or castle tower. This is also uh, designated as a uh, national treasure. And this one is Matsue Castle, which was built early modern times and about 400 years ago. And this as well. They were built almost 400 years ago, all of them. And they are um, designated as national treasure. And Hikone Castle as well, 400 years old and also nat national treasure. And attacking this kind of castle was quite difficult. So how to attack a castle? Mainly there are four tactics. Part tactics, starvation tactics, water tactics, or flooding tactics, etc. So through those tactics, uh, the armies would attack the castle. And first, part tactics. So re reckless attack. No specific um, tactics, but just use force. And uh, that attacking force would use a um, bundle of bamboos, etc., or shield, and hide themselves behind them and invade into the castles. But it w was likely to have cannon attack, and the casualty on the army was also huge. And if you don't have a big uh, troop, strength, it will be difficult because attacking force would need three times more troop strength than the one holding a castle. So if you don't have um, big troop of strength, you could lose. Next one is starvation tactics. And if you uh, use the power tactics, casualty on your force or on your army may be large. 
So through the starvation tactics, the armies would um, prevent food or bombs from, uh, from being brought into a castle. And for that, they will, starve, uh, they will uh, surround the castle and they wait until uh, the enemy surrender because they run out of food. So it may sound like a peaceful way of attacking, but uh, from the attacking force point of view, but the sieged side will need to suffer from starvation because they don't have access to food, etc. And this one is the flooding tactics or water tactics. So with these tactics, so with the water attacks, um, they will flood a castle and attack. Uh, they will still surround the castle so that food and bombs will not be brought into the castle. And the sieged side will run out of drinking water. And also they will be surrounded by unsanitary uh, environment because of the polluted water. And food will no longer be good to eat if they are flooded by water. That is why um, that, that is the water tactics. And uh, it's about flooding a castle. That's why it's surrounded by water and the uh, soldiers in the castle are not able to come out from the castle. So uh, the uh, so in a way it is similar to starvation policy because the siege site will suffer from starvation. But probably it's, it's quite unique to uh, Japan. You won't hear these tactics in other countries maybe because um, the um, flatland castle uh, banks are constructed and then they uh, will try to change the flow of a river to ca uh, flood the castle. And th there are many castles built on the flat land. That's made, that is the reason why water tactics was often taken. And next one is fire tactics, the one using fires to burn down the castles. Oh, and they use uh, the fire arrows to attack the castle. And once the fire arrows hit the castle, then it starts fire and burn down the castle and lose a place to live as well as food. Or throw in a cooking pot made of uh, the soil. It's like a, a bomb, fire bomb, and throw it into the castle. It was already seen in that period, in medieval era. This was another tactics. And uh, using these four tactics, what happens with the defense side, then uh, if they run out of the way to come back, then they have to surrender. But uh, surrender not necessarily mean that uh, the those attacked or on defense should die. And uh, capitulation was often done on the condition to save the castle owner. But uh, the condition was often ignored and the castle's owner was sometimes forced to commit suicide by Tsumebara. But the, all the rest of the uh, retainers or the people working in the castle were saved if the castle owner committed suicide to take a responsibility. And next is the fall of a castle, meaning that no one can be saved. So at the end of a fierce battle, then the last thing to see was the fall of a castle because uh, there was a tendency that as a samurai uh, had to be, uh, samurai had a mindset that uh, they should avoid surviving when losing the battle. And it was more respectable to rather commit suicide uh, rather than uh, surviving after the loss. Then often, uh, and after the attack of the castle, once the leader or the most important person commit a suicide to take responsibility, then uh, the, all the people working under that leader were often saved. Next is a uh, field battle, 
And these are the places of a field battle right river, plain paths, and footpaths between rice fields. Because thinking about the geographical characteristic of Japan, we don't see a very wide or broad plain land. So plain um, field battle in a plain field was not so often seen, and uh, of, more often seen was the riverside or the paths uh, because of the geographical feature of Japan. And next, I'd like to show you some uh, traditional armors actually used in the battles. So at the time of battle, there was a traditional etiquette as described here. First thing they need to do is to state one's name because uh, Samurai was originally a uh, middle-class aristocrats, and this is a traditional etiquette of the middle-class aristocrats. So before starting the one-on-one -on -one battle, they always state their name. And I said that uh, samurai riding horse was their privilege in time at the time of combat. And they first uh, use arrows to uh, combat from a distance and uh, when it comes to a close battle while riding the horse after attacking by arrows then I uh, they start uh, the dog fight and if one falls off his horse then he comes to grapple with the opponent and start a dog fight these are the traditional etiquette of the samurai or battle but uh, in the medieval era or, or pre-modern era, uh, it became a group battle. And the name announcement no longer carried out after group battle became common in coming ages. But the, uh, the standard style of starting a battle was one-on-one. And the changes in the medieval or pre-modern era is that uh, the use of the matchlock guns, which had a huge influence over the battle style of Japan, because uh, you can attack enemies from distance, and that had a st strong influence on the tactics. So they shoot the match guns uh, from the distance, and then uh, when the battle formation collapsed, then the cavalry warriors charged ahead. But before that, uh, they used long spears after shooting the match guns. So a team battle that put a large quantity of match lock guns, that was uh, the characteristic of the uh, pretty modern era combat style. And uh, it works very effectively from the distance, but uh, when they come to a closer contact, they use uh, long spears. And you may often see on a TV drama that the samurai are always combating with the swords, but uh, actually, in reality, swords were only used in a close contact battle, and uh, they rather use long spears before getting so close. And when it comes to the close contact or the dogfight, then this used swords as a last resort. And this is a, a photo from a festival replicating the a battle style of that time. The flags were used to uh, tell if the person is or on your side or the enemy. The flag was used to tell if uh, you are, if uh, the soldier is on your side or the opponent's side. And this is uh, he's replicating the uh, Uesugi Kenshin. He's a very well-known high-profile samurai or warlord. And he's riding on a horse and using samurai on horseback. 
this is a replication of his battle style. So uh, swords were used as a last resort. But the swords used in the battlefield, and whereas uh, I said that the uh, samurai always wore uh, two swords, long and and uh, short ones, as a, a symbolic uh, dress code for samurai. But in the actual battlefield, they use a tachi, long sword, in some cases, which is as long as 70 centimeters or longer. And tachi was uh, kept on a waist, and uh, the edge of the sword was facing downward. That was uh, the characteristic of this sword. And this is a picture of me. You can see that the edge of the sword is facing downwards, and that's a characteristic of a long sword tachi. On the other hand, the more commonly used on a daily life was a uh, uchi katana. This is uh, the longer one of the two swords uh, kept by samurai on a daily basis. So this, uh, when people say uh, sword or Nihonto in general, then it often refers to this uchi katana, and I'm actually showing uh, the uchi katana. Tachi is even longer, and uh, the edge was facing down, but the uchi katana is the opposite, so edge is facing up, and uh, kept like this on the west. And why the blade is upward is because it's easier to attack the enemy. It's seamless. Whereas Tachi, edge is facing down, so you have to pull it out, and then you have to turn it around before attacking. And Uchi Katana is a little shorter than Tachi, so the basic weapon for samurai was a long sword. And uh, Tachi had been used since ancient time. And uh, Tachi was sometimes uh, shortened to turn it into Uchi Katana. But of course, uh, the sword is kept in a shell because uh, it's very sharp and dangerous. And uh, here, uh, the shark skin is used for grip. And you can, of course, dismantle into uh, parts. But uh, I just wanted to show you the sample of Uchi Katana. And in this picture, you can see on my waist, uh, I wear, I'm i wearing uchi katana or daito, and wakizashi, the shortest one, is also worn by samurai as a set of two uh, with uchi katana and wakizashi to demonstrate their power. But of course, uh, you cannot carry around a katana or swords. You'll be um, caught by the police because it's illegal. And next is a wakizashi, which is about uh, 30 centimeters or longer. And, and looking at the global situation of the swords, it's uh, often a straight line, but uh, Japanese sword is curved, and uh, the blade or the edge is only on one side, because rather than sticking the sword, uh, Japanese sword is used to cut the enemy. And that is a traditional model or style of Japanese swords which is curved. And 
I just show the example of long sword uchi katana worn together with a short sword wakizashi. So if you uh, see someone on the street with these two swords, then uh, it represents that that person is a samurai. But uh, in the pre-modern era, the main weapon was uh, spears. And you may see uh, swords were often used in a TV drama of the wartime. However, in reality, in pre-modern time, um, spears was the main arms. And uh, military exploits are proficient at using spears. And the, the spears were as long as uh, 1 meters or 1.5 meters and a group of a lower-ranking samurai uses long spears as long as six meters or longer. And uh, it's quite difficult to maneuver spears. It's, and uh, long ones is more like uh, demonstrating the power uh, to uh, scare the enemy. And uh, if you really like to attack the enemy with the spears, then a uh, shorter one is easier to handle. That's why samurai was using the shorter ones, but uh, still longer than uh, swords. So spears can be used uh, when there's a, a bit longer distance between the enemy, but uh, it is too long when the enemy comes uh, within one meter reach then in that case they have to use the swords. So uh, samurai use a different arms, types of arms, depending on the situation. And in the case of Japan, once uh, the uh, guns become proliferant, then uh, the tactics have changed after the pre-modern period. But uh, the difference between the modern gun is that uh, the machiro gun is fire, is strong. But uh, if it rains, then it's a problem. So it was not possible to fully replace uh, the arrows or archery. So about 50% uh, of the uh, troops were able to use both the matchlock guns or the archeries. So I just talked about the type of uh, arms used then. And next, let me explain the, the Japanese traditional helmet and armor. And the uh, helmet is, of course, to protect the head. And I'm not wearing one, but of course, uh, in the actual battle of that time, the samurai was wearing the helmet. And f to protect the body, it is called an armor. And uh, these armors and helmets were first developed in the, the pre-modern period. And pre-modern era. The helmet and armor were to fully protect the uh, human body and face. And uh, this is made of metal plate, real metal. Because uh, guns were used, much of the guns were used. I've never tried with the uh, actual uh, gun bullet, but I don't think uh, the bullet can pierce through because this is a real metal. And like I said, uh, the, it's a full protection all over the body. So it has arm cover and thigh cover or shin cover. So made of all different parts to protect all over the body. And this is how it looks like in full. This is helmet or kabuto often made of uh, metal or iron and it's in painted in red with urushi lacquer 
And this one is uh, painted with uh, the black lacquer. So often red and black were used for the traditional Japanese helmet and armor. And when you wear a helmet, then you cannot see uh, the face. So uh, the top of the helmet, there was a crest to, to show who it is or to show the identity of the person because as you can see that uh, red color is very easy and stands out in the battlefield. It's not like uh, the desert pattern, like the modern uh, uniform. And rather they want to stand out in the battlefield. So I said that uh, the metal plate is used and it's not flexible, so there need to be a hinge to connect separate pieces, like five pieces or two pieces. Now I'm going to show you. And like this. And so it can easily take it off. Sorry, I fit, um, moved out of the screen, but so uh, it can be dismantled like this, and there's a hinge, and you can pull it out, and like this, you can fur further decompose. You can, like this, take out all the parts. So now I have one plate, two plates, so five pieces. Uh, breath plates are connected uh, with hinges. And this is uh, called doll to uh, protect on um, torso and everything uh, or the plates are connected through hinges so they can be uh, disconnected if I remove the hinges. And next, kote or gantlets from the shoulder to hand, uh, we can uh, predict uh, with this uh, gauntlet. It's also made of the iron plates. And even if someone strikes uh, you with a sword, you can predict your arms. Like this. I'm OK with that. Haidate or thigh guard. Probably you can't really see. So, thigh guard or haidate as to protect thighs. And shin guards or suniate, probably you can't see, but uh, this is to protect the shins, which is also made of iron. Uh, iron is used for protection from katana or sword. And before I end, I would like to show you how to wear this uh, armor. And there are multiple types of armors, but this is modern armor. The one that I showed you, so it was considered as modern during the um, medieval times in Japan. So it was the modern at the time. But let uh, this is a shin guard uh, that's attached from the left side. For armors, um, for all the pieces of armors, you have to start from the left hand side of the body because think of uh, when you use the uh, bows and you will have your enemies on the left. So when wearing uh, the uh, armors, you first start with the left hand side because that's the side where your enemy will be attacking you from and start with the shin guards, which is then followed by haidate or thigh guard to protect your thighs. 
and then、uh, put on gauntlets also from the left side. Start with the left. Because this is the side、uh, where your enemy will be attacking you from. So start with the left and then move over to the right. And then breastplate or doll, wear a breastplate. This is also made of iron、uh, plate, so、um, it will have hinges. So the one I was wearing was five pieces version, and this one in the picture, two pieces. So the front and the back. It can be broken into two pieces, and the two pieces are put together or connected with a hinge. So, this is how you can open two breastplates. And if there's no hint, it, it's only a mere、um, arm plate, so you can't really wear it. And if you wear the armors, there are a heavy weight on your shoulder. And that is why, to release a burden on the shoulder,、uh, we、uh, wrap a breastplate around the waist. With this strip, and helmet comes in the end. So, wear the Japanese、uh, traditional helmet and fasten the chin strap. So, this is how、uh, we wear this、uh, Tosei Gusoku or modern armor. So, that's, the, that's how it looks when it's completed. And you can see the hinge, and it's made of iron plates. That, that is why, even if someone strikes you with a sword,、uh, they can't cut it. And it has another、uh, part called、uh, shoulder guards. And there's a version with the shoulder guards and the one without it. The one I'm wearing does not have one, but the one in the picture has the shoulder guards. So that was about the modern armor. And next, I would like to、uh, show you ancient style armor. This is a replica of the ancient armors, but basically,、um, how you wear it is the same. But、um, ancient style armors have a、uh, looks more gorgeous. But this way of wearing armor is the same. First, attach from the left. Uh, you start with the left、uh, shin guards and then go to the right hand side. And then thigh guard, the same. And kote or gantlets, start from the left and then move on to the right. And do a breastplate. This one is also made of two pieces. And How should I say?、Uh, the、uh, two plates are always、uh, so the,、uh, the, the, you will be attacked from the left. So it has to be always closed on the right hand side. And same for me,、um, my、uh, brush plates are closed on the right hand side. And again,、um, because、uh, the breastplate is heavy, we will wrap the breastplate around the waist to avoid or to、uh, reduce the burden on the shoulder. And kabuto or helmet. So, an、uh, ancient、um, helmet, the,、uh, the one from the Modern times was much simpler, and you can see the crest here. And it, this is a whole shaped helmet crest, and this is the helmet, the replica of the helmet that、um, was used by the middle ranking aristocrats when they fought on horseback. So, this is ancient style. Ancient style. Armors were also preferred as well. A little bit more,、um, more splendid or gorgeous than the simpler, simpler modern armor. So now it's a complete set. And so samurai would fight wearing like this, they will fight on horseback, which could be quite a lot of work. 
and this is the present time armor so maybe uh, so maybe slightly different than the past but it looked this way and um, till pre-modern time, uh, Japan did not have war for 2.6 million years, and so there were samurai who didn't know how to wear armors. And there was a best-selling book called How to Wear Armors, because there's been such a long years of uh, no um, wars. So samurai and some of the bushi didn't know how to wear it or they didn't even own or have any armors those so they w had to buy um sets of armors in hurry but if you uh know how to wear um armors maybe you can use this um knowledge sometime someday but anyway that will be all from my side today thank you very much for your kind attention Thank you, Oda-san. So we would now like to proceed to the question and answer. So if you have um, any question, please post your questions to the uh, chat box. So samurai to use katana, they, they have to use their right-hand side. Um, and those who are left-handed, they cannot be a samurai. They, could, they cannot be samurai then. Uh, yes, um, they were left-handed, uh, uh, or uh, people um, w uh, whose dominant hand is left, but they will be uh, converted to right-handed. They were trained that way, so if you, your, your dominant hand is left, you cannot be a samurai as it is. Okay, next question is um, about the um, attacking approach like fire, the, 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 the fire or flat attack. How many um, castle soldiers did they have and what the scale of the battles? It depends. So for starvation policy, for example, it's going to be large scale for both armies. So attacking side, there will be uh, the tens of thousands. And also the uh, sieged side, it's not just 100 or 200. Uh, if it, uh, the castle size is small, then the attacking army will simply attack by force, reckless attack. And in case of uh, flooding a castle, they need to uh, construct or build bunks. So probably 10,000, 20,000 soldiers. Thank you. And um, the construct or const um, how the castle is built is different than the location. Yes, it's very different. In case of the uh, mountain castle, it has this uh, natural uh, fort. So, but in case of the flatland castle, there's nothing to protect. So they will uh, have the artificial moat. So the uh, construct or the structure is very different. Thank you. Another question, samurai, what kind of shoes did they use to wear? Uh, they would be uh, wearing a kind of a straw sandal. And for um, the upper or higher ranking ones, they may uh, wear shoes made of leather, but usually straw sandals. Next question castle um so hill castle flatland castle and mountain castle which castle is more uh, the strongest if the scale is the same well at the end of that day it depends on how much money you can spend if you have enough uh, if you have lots of money flatland castle i think it will be the strongest but it means that you need to uh, you need the huge land and also you need a very big uh moat so if you have the uh, money to do that type of huge construction then i would say the flatland castle is the strongest but with uh, if the budget is uh, limited in mountain castle i think will be the strongest because you can use the power of the nature to, and they use as nature as a fort thank you any other question uh, 
Okay, if not, um, Oda-san, thank you very much for the great presentation. With that, we'd like to close part two. So now we will have a short break. And from 10 past five, we will have Ms. Ebisawa, and she will cover part three, Living in the Present with a Samurai Wisdom. So please stay tuned. Thank you very much.
17時10分となりました Now it's five past,、uh, ten past five. I am ready for the third session. Now I'd like to invite to run Ebi Sawa san for her session. Samurai Spirit, no mind. I'm the representative director of International Samurai Association. My name is Ran Ebi Saya, and my theme is Samurai Spirits, No Mind, and Living Healthy. In this unprecedented pandemic, what kind of、uh, wisdom I'd like to introduce today of samurai spirits? And I'd like to focus on no mind. This is more about the state of mind. Why I chose this as a theme is because now we are living under the COVID pandemic, and、uh, all the world, all the people in the world, is living under. Pandemic, and if you are a foreign student in a different country, then you may feel more isolated than、uh, the people who are living there as a local resident. So, to get through this difficulty, I'd like to introduce this no mind of samurai spirits because、uh, this concept or wisdom is really, really helpful for our. Our lives who are living today. But before going to the main topic, let me briefly introduce myself. And my family name is Aibi Sawa, and my ancestors were all samurai throughout the samurai era. And the last one of a samurai generation. And as you can see on this map, this And、uh, just so, J A S O -so、means this venue, and you can see the numbers、uh, around this area, and、uh, these spots indicate the、uh, location of the battery island batteries, and there were seven、oh, remainder still exist. And one of my ancestors and the last generation of samurai undertook a duty of protecting Edo Castle from the Perry exhibition in a battery island. And when you heard, hear the word samurai, what kind of image would you conjure up? Like Tom Cruise of Last Samurai, who d o n t afraid of dying and very courageous. But actually, what I heard about my family story from my father, how my, what my ancestors were like, are different. So, how they lived in reality, like an Edo era samurai. And one of my ancestors was serving for Tokugawa, a feudal government, and serving as a onando, that is a role to take care of the crops, keep them in the、uh, storage, and to make a booking or like an accountant of the、uh, crop storage. But in the case of、uh, the crisis, They were mobilized to、uh, defend the Edo Castle, like in this case, the Perry Expedition. And、uh, in modern world, we can do whatever we like、uh, because we have light or electricity. But the Edo era, they used oil lamp because there was no electricity and the oil was very expensive. So they tended to go to sleep. Early in the evening, and they woke up early in the morning to save lights. So their work day was very short. And what my ancestors were doing is that their daily duty ended around lunchtime, and they, they did like side jobs, helping the、uh, meal cooking of their、um, superiors. Or bosses. So, those are the things what I heard about my ancestor as a samurai episode, and I felt that、uh, they are more or less the same as us. Nothing special about them. And please look at the left hand side of the screen. 
and uh, our family heritage or uh, the family rule is to uh, practice the martial arts. And in the middle, you can see it's myself and my father. And my father is uh, uh, the trainer or instructor of uh, Naginata, which is a Japanese uh, the, uh, Japanese spears. And we are inheriting the traditional style. And our school is Ishin Ryu. And in the next session, actually, we are going to show you the live demo. So uh, please, looking forward to it. So uh, those are the brief introduction of my activities. And I'm a woman, and I live in the modern world. And hi, why am I thinking that uh, it would be good to share samurai spirits? Because uh, in the uh, life-changing events, I was often helped by the samurai wisdom. So I'd like to share my experience, how I was helped by samurai wisdom. And as you can see that uh, you may not think that I was bullied, but uh, when I was a child, I was very shy and introvert. So I didn't have many friends. I'm not good at socializing and rather want to stay by myself and uh, drawing the pictures and so on. So I was often a target of bullying. For example, one day when I went to a school, then I was ostracized and I noticed that uh, the next target is me. And I imagined the life would be tough in my uh, elementary school. So I stopped going out with my friends and I stayed at home by myself. Then my parents noticed that something wrong with me, but I don't want it to be noticed because I don't want to my I don't want my parents to notice that I was bullied. And my father actually also uh, participated in the demo and he gave me a very uh, shocking words. Like he laughed and said that you are bullied. You normally think that uh, parents worry about the children if uh, they think that a child might be bullied. But my father said that how you live is up to you. And when you are bullied or when you're in trouble with someone, then you might feel miserable or uh, the blame yourself. But you don't need to victimize yourself. And you can choose whether to live as a victim or to live in a different way. And that leads to my main theme of today, no mind. That was the very first step where I became conscious of uh, the state of mind. And I decided to choose to become a strong person and I started to practice Naginata when I was in the middle school. And I practiced very, very hard to uh, compete in a tournament. And I started to win. And I often win like uh, the trophy or a medal. I became really strong. Then I became very confident. And I felt very positive about me that I used to be bullied, but now I'm very strong. And then my mind was obsessed with the idea that I should be strong. And that's what I want to say from this, that the your state of mind uh, is reflected in the world you are living. And next, I hit the wall and in my activity uh, of uh, International Summer Association, I took one year to one year to work on the uh, project to do something uh, outside Japan. And for that success, and I quit the job to be dedicated to the International Summer Association project. So I became freelance 
for the success of the,、uh, the association, but、uh, I faced the betrayal of my colleagues. And my opportunities and money were taken, or I lost all of everything. And it was around this time of the year, in my 30s, I, I was struggling with my work and I lost a source of income, so I couldn't pay my rent. And I also couldn't pay the Electricity. So it was a Christmas time and people were happy, but I lost everything. I lost my、uh, place to live, I lost the electricity, and I was so miserable and so depressed. No job, but I had a plenty of time. So at that time, I、uh, picked up one book which explains the way of samurai, how they lived. And、uh, that helped me a lot. And the、uh, name of the book is Hagakure. And、uh, there was a samurai in Edo era, hundreds of years ago, wrote this book,、uh, Yamamoto Jojo. Jojo Yamamoto was the author explaining the、uh, samurai wisdom. And please look at the text in red. These were the most impressive messages I found in this book. And Bushido, or the code of samurai, is found to die, meaning that not, you may think that it means that、uh, samurai are not afraid of dying, but、uh, actually, Yamamoto Jojo is saying that、uh, you shouldn't be. You shouldn't die for nothing. For example, someone, if someone s a y to you that you will die tomorrow, then you'll be shocked and panic. But、uh, what Yamamoto Jojo wanted to say is that、uh, live your day to the full every day so that you won't regret when you die. That was the main message. And when I read book, this book and this message, I looked back and、uh, thought if I was. Really, isho kenme means that、uh, risk one's life and do whatever possible, meaning that I question myself whether I put everything I can do or all my efforts to the success of International Samurai Association. And if it's in line with、uh, this message of Jojo Yamamoto, and、uh, Jojo Yamamoto actually said that、uh, if you Make utmost efforts, then you can even move the mountain. And I thought that my effort was not enough and not reaching that level. And so, some of the code of samurai is quite tough. But、uh, if you are interested in this book, then you can find the book in English. You can、uh, go online and find an English copy. And based on my actual experience, And at that time, I said that I was only focusing on winning the competition. But I noticed that the samurai put a lot of importance on the mind. And the next thing I found that influenced me then is more about the state of mind or how important the mind was for samurai. And on the left hand side, he's a monk, Takuan. And、uh, he was、uh, alive when in the early Edo period. And he also emphasized the importance of the state of mind. And、uh, Takuan Wrote some letters to Yagyu Munenori. He was a very powerful warlord as well as a politician of the same era. And he sent a very、uh, insightful letters to、uh, Yagyu Munenori. And、uh, he emphasized, Takwa emphasized that the state of mind has a strong influence on your life. And、uh, it has、uh, several chapters, so I like to refer to the chapter、uh, to describing、uh, Mushin or no mind. What it means 
is that if you are obsessed with something or focus on something particular, then、uh, you will be、uh, obsessed with that idea. So you should not be biased or you should、uh, look at the world、uh, like 360 in thoroughness. For example, let me give you an easy example to explain what I mean by the state of mind. And、uh, chopsticks is something you need to learn to use. So, at, the fir at first, when you are given a pair of chopsticks, then you don't know how to use it, how to maneuver, because it's just、uh, two pieces of stick. So, you need to learn how to use, you need to practice. That's the second step. And you become better in using it and、uh, pick up the small、uh, pieces of food and so on. It can be used in many different ways. Then, now you learn how to use chopsticks very well. And without trying, you can use chopstick. Without any problems because you practice so much. However, no mind machine to maintain machine is really difficult because, in this example of chopstick, please imagine that、uh, if there is someone you really like in front of you and you, are, you want to. Ask for a date, and、uh, the person said yes. And、uh, the counterpart said that she wants to eat Japanese food. So you really wanted to date with he or her, and、uh, going to a Japanese restaurant as requested. But if the counterpart is very, very strict with the、uh, etiquette, Of eating, then you might start worrying if I can really use、uh, chopstick properly and so on. So, our mind is often、uh, the stirred by those、uh, unnecessary worries or anxiety. That is why Yagi Mune Nori emphasizes the importance of the mushin or no mind. And samurai, not only mind. But technique and physical strength, the balance of the three was emphasized a lot for samurai. They believe this balance is important to deliver the maximum performance. So, if、uh, your mind is free, you're not、uh, obsessed with anything, then naturally、uh, you can contain physical strength or health as well. And imagine when you are under stress or when you're irritated, maybe you feel pain in your,、um, your stomach or you feel stiff shoulders. So, body and mind are directly linked with each other. So, you need both well balanced. With a stable mind and physical strength, you can utilize your technique and、uh, deliver maximum performance. So, for samurai, they do not simply practice martial arts, but they train their mind as well. And that is something we can also、uh, say about ourselves. We can keep、um, uh, being healthy because we have a stable state of mind and we can focus on work and study, delivering good results. So, the balance of、uh, spirit, technique, and physical strength, the samurai valued, are also a very important and needed balance for us in the current time. Please remember that. But I used analogy or example of chopsticks, chopsticks earlier, but we Every day are interrupted by the worldly thoughts. Let me、uh, give you an e easy example of when we could be troubled by the worldly thought. For example, let's say in university or school, you have to make a presentation. And the research that you've been doing, the study that you've been doing, you feel nervous whether presentation will be、uh, successful, and naturally you'll feel tense or fear. And then, when you're in that situation, what are you looking at? You are looking at the figure of the audience. 
in the presentation, you're looking at their facial expressions or titles, and then you make yourself feel nervous and you put yourself into the fearful situation. The counterpart is not doing anything, the audience is not doing anything, but you make yourself feel more um, t uh, t tense. So because of the title of the um, audience, for example, this person has better qualification than me, and this person uh, looks angry, maybe he's bored by my presentation, uh, or maybe this, um, the, uh, you find um, someone in the audience who is more handsome for, is more beautiful than you, I'm not, uh, I am inferior, then uh, you feel intimidated and you're not able to deliver the maximum performance that you have, you can deliver. And samurai, how did they use this uh, mushin or no mind state? So no mind does not mean you don't feel anything or you don't think anything. When you hear the word no mind, mushin is in the Japanese word in English translation is no mind. But no mind, but there's nothing that you're in everything. It's very difficult to explain. You're not, your mind is not staying in one place. That's why your mind is being present in the whole. So, to the situation, to enemy, or to opportunities, your mind, your mind is being present across all of these in this example. An easy example may be, for example, uh, you, um, your face in front of the mirror, and then samurai, same for me, but when we do a practice of martial arts, we don't look at the s one point. It may look like we are looking at one point, but we're looking at the entire things. That is, the same goes for the state of mind. If your mind is sticking to one thing, your mind will not, uh, you cannot pay attention to other things. So samurai always bears that in mind, and they try, uh, that's why um, they um, uh, were able to, have their mind uh, st uh, uh, look uh, focusing on the whole things, including situation, enemies, and opportunities, and also their thinking of subtra subtraction. And nowadays, we tend to uh, think of addition. So, for example, I'm missing this, so I'm not good enough. I'm not. Uh, equipped with this and that, that's why I cannot be promoted. We tend to um, focus on addition, but somewhere in the old days took this uh, subtraction approach. For example, on the left-hand side, you can see swordsmanship, uh, unnecessary power, get rid of unnecessary force. When you use heavy sword and naginata, you may tend to think that you need lots of power, but if you apply too much power, your body becomes stiff and you uh, start to uh, have shallow breathing. It's hard to breathe. That your mind uh, should not be rigid. It has to be graceful as bamboo. And what do I mean by that in part four, where I will do a demonstration of Naginata with a few students. I hope that you can see that during the uh, demonstration or performance. And number two, uh, uh, get rid of the unnecessary manners. Uh, so you can see them meditation. Uh, and uh, also, uh, when you think of tea ceremony, uh, avoid unnecessary manners or actions. You can see that during the tea ceremony too, because as I said, mind and body are always linked. So if you have extra unnecessary actions or manners, that may result in unnecessary thoughts. And I am standing right now, so I'm sorry I cannot show it to you, but summarize, they would, uh, they, uh, when they wake up on tatami mat, they, I think you will put your hands, palms, on the tatami mat if you are asked to stand up. But samurai wouldn't do it because your ha um, hand is touching the floor or the tatami mat. Then at, the, at that exact moment, the enemy may attack you. But uh, if you think of uh, a similar uh, thing can be said of tea ceremony, if you have extra uh, action, then that could be taken 
uh, that can be uh, leveraged by your enemy and they may attack you. And also if you have extra unnecessary actions uh, that may um, result in unnecessary thoughts. So the third one is unnecessary thoughts. So that's where uh, meditation comes into play. You may have tried um, meditation before and a very quiet place. You sit there and then uh, different uh, things will come out of your mind and then unleash them, no judgment, let them come out. And then the preconceived idea that you may have had, you are able to be from, uh, you are able to be free from those unnecessary thoughts. So, three substructions of removing extra unnecessary power, unnecessary actions, and unnecessary thoughts. That was the approach Samurai has taken to be no mind. So, um, coming back, uh, coming on to whether no mind means no emotions. So I have an easy to understand uh, example here. So you, uh, well, there's something I want you to try. So s think of someone that you really hate, someone uh, that annoys you a lot, then what happens? Do you feel the, uh, maybe uh, your stomach starts to be, uh, uh, have some pain? That, that's your body reaction. But when you think of someone that you love a lot, someone that you really want to meet desperately, then your mind, what happens to your mind? Thrilled or heartwarming feeling? I think that's something you experience. And that, in case of samurai, both are not good. When you have something happy that you, uh, you get excited, you'll be very happy, but for Samurai that was never acceptable. Because as you can see in this picture, the positive and negative, uh, they're pendulum. So because of the uh, physics, if you move towards one side, with the same level of power, you'll be brought back. And same goes for mind. If you're extremely excited and when, when that event ends, then you, you, you feel very exhausted. You're drawn back with the same level of force. And samurai, whenever they win a battle, if they get so excited with the victory, and then when the next attacks come, they won't be able to respond. So for samurai, this, they have to, uh, it was important for them to ha um, uh, uh, have their mind on middle way, middle position. And this is uh, middle way, middle position is uh, the word in Buddhism. But you don't make any judgment. There's no good or bad. That's all. It's simply there. No judgment. So that this is the idea of middle way, middle position. So it's not that you don't have any emotion. Always in natural state or neutral state. Something good happens, something bad happens, that you don't show it. You simply observe. So no mind does not mean no emotion. And also samurai has this mindset of middle way, middle position. Then they are always alerted or they stay alerted so that they won't be attacked. And so uh, this middle way, middle position, then meditation, that is what I talked about. But the swordsmanship and martial arts, then they're all aiming at the same thing. And people normally surprise, get surprised when I tell them this. But on the left, you can see Zen. And for Zen, um, people say emotion in stillness. And for martial arts or Budo, uh, it's, um, stillness in motion. For Zen, you quietly, uh, with silently observe, no judgment feel here now and you look into yourself inner yourself inner you and then on the other hand for martial arts you observe emotion but no judgment you feel here now and inside yourself and stillness emotion what do i mean by that later you can watch me doing this later but it's very hard you wear protective arms but Equipment. And then um, during competitive match, you have to keep uh, moving. And then uh, you are occupied with different worldly thought. Oh, I don't want to lose. The enemy is stronger. But you need to observe. 
and uh, foresee what move the opponent may take next. And but what happens is when you have this kind of worldly thoughts, you uh, you should you can still try to maintain the state of no mind. So motion is stillness, stillness in motion. So and delightness, anger, sorrow, pleasure, present, past, future. And by practicing Zen and martial arts, you'll be able to um, free yourself from all those things. And uh, so Zen and the uh, Code of Samurai are actually aiming at achieving the same summit, the same uh, peak. It's just um, whether you want to um, climb up from the right or left. And we, the modern people, we are in an environment where we're easily uh, clinging to certain things. So we worry about different things like uh, jobs, money, health, personal relationship or interpersonal relationship. And we worry about what has happened in the past, what will happen now, what will happen in the future, and COVID-19, what's going to happen to my job, I'm going to get a job or not. So uh, we are easily occupied by uh, all different thoughts. And then um, how can we utilize then samurai wisdom in our everyday life? We now are actually similar to samurai in terms of how we live. Samurai uh, would uh, commute to uh, the castle. They wear armors and they will have helmet on. They will wear their swords. And we uh, work for a company or we start our own company. We wear ties and we bring computers. And it's the same as uh, armors. And in case samurai, the workplace is just a castle, but how we live is actually similar to them. And you can see uh, pictures of samurai's residence and think about this. There's one thing that's common among all these pictures. What do you think it may be? On the floor, there is nothing at all, nothing extra on the floor. Very well organized, very tidy. And I talked about eliminating unnecessary actions or manners. But if your floor has lots of items and articles scattered around, uh, you will be considered where did I put that? Where is that one? But Samurai, um, their residence, their house was always well organized because they don't know at any moment uh, uh, the enemy may attack them. And when there are a lot of things on the floor, then uh, they may uh, fall because of that. And also, you can see the picture of uh, uh, Naginata uniform, and we always keep them always tidy because we can always respond to an attack. And to make that happen, we always have this uh, uniform and protective equipment uh, for, uh, um, well organized. So, so you can see on the left hand side of this page, uh, People who do not, who are not lazy, they um, always have their uh, equipment and tools always uh, kept in tidy and well organized. They're uh, always nicely dressed and their mind is also healthy. They pay attention to manners and behavior. They can keep their thought always clear and uh, they can keep this state of no mind. And uh, try it. Uh, if you stop taking bath for one week, then you uh, uh, you feel that you don't want to go out, and uh, you feel you will lo you're losing vitality. And also, your attitude, if you are too much laid back, then your action becomes very slow. So please remember the, how tidy was a samurai resident. That will help you to maintain a no mind state. On the other hand, when we live a daily life and we confront with others, then we were often swayed by this uh, shui kyaku, shui and kyakui. What it means that the shui means that the bandage position, 
and、uh, take a lead depending on the situation. CACU E is in a disadvantaged position. And、uh, the people relation is built on、uh, the Shui and CACU E. And you are always trying to understand which side you are. Then, if you are not confident when you present, then you are in a kakui, you lose confidence and、uh, you become unsettled and、uh, you cannot perform to the full. But if you are in a shui or in a bandage position, then you can have confidence and exert your full potential. So, this is a、uh, very helpful idea to remember. Because if you are in a shui position or state of mind, then、uh, you can be very stable. For example, if you think that、uh, you're in a negative position, kakui, then the samurai has、uh, the way to、uh, turn it around. And、uh, this is how can one can get through the adverse condition. So let's observe the condition. Or atmosphere, that's my. Or, so, when you think that you're in a negative position, then、uh, say or greet to the others in a loud voice so that you can turn around and、uh, turn your position into positive. And、uh, Mazumori, how to do Mazumori to observe condition is to feel the atmosphere. For example, when you say good morning and the, your counterpart doesn't sound happily but say、oh, good morning, then there might be something wrong. Or if it's、uh, full of confidence, then they might think that、uh, the, your counterpart might have a certain idea to play with you. So, important thing is、uh, Matsumori. Or my eye to observe the condition and the situation and read the air. And if you think that you're in a negative position, so first thing is to observe the condition, and the next step is to how to address that situation. And in samurai time, it's called miku, mikiru. And what it means is to try to understand the true intention of your enemy or the、uh, counterpart. Like、uh, to protect yourself from the negative feelings, like、uh, fear. Or surprise and、uh, doubt or uncertainty. And please look at the second point. Ku means fear. And、uh, you become very tense when you feel fear and you cannot make the next move. But、uh, Mikiru helps you to get out of that situation. And Gi means a doubt, means that you cannot trust the counterpart or even yourself. Then、uh, it slows down your decision and、uh, miss the opportunity. Waku means to. Bewildering or to meander. That often slows down the decision making or to swift next action. So, when you observe your counterpart, when you greet, then you can observe the condition of your counterpart so that you can free yourself from these four negative feelings. And you can maintain a normal mind state as well. So, I've talked a lot about、uh, samurai wisdom because samurai has、uh, 900 years of wisdom and I had to summarize in 40 minutes, which is really, really a challenge. So, let me emphasize the main point. So, I use the analogy of chopstick, how we practice. and Suppose that you are a foreign student,、uh, went to a different country, then you have a very positive and excited feeling. And that means、uh, how you feel at the very beginning of、uh, start something new, like shoshin, is the feeling when you start something very new. 
but then、uh, over time you start to feel or you start to find、uh, some issues or worries and so on, and start to feel negative emotions. For example, under the COVID 19 pandemic, if you feel anxiety and so on, please remember no mind. And no mind is the same state as a shoshin, the feeling when you feel when you start doing something new. So that is my message of this session. An important thing is to remember. And I said that less is more, and it can be like tidying up and cleaning up your own house as well. So get relaxed and、uh, remove all unnecessary thoughts. Try this, and then if these are not enough, then uh, please uh, keep working as hard as possible, like Yamamoto said. or And I'm almost running out of time, so I should stop. And、uh, in the next session, the fourth session, I invite、uh, two students to show the demo, live demo. So you can see what I meant, these concepts in practice. That's all for me.、And、with that, I'd like to conclude my presentation. Thank you so much. Ebisawa-san, thank you so much for your presentation. And now let's move on to QA. So, if any of the audience has、uh, questions for Ibi Sawa san, then please post in the chat of YouTube.、Uh, so, to maintain the no mind state, then we shouldn't be obsessed with others. How sh we should confront or、uh, build a relationship with others. And I think that that person who asks a question might have、uh, some negative concern. What I usually Do is to look at that person or others like a part of a scenery, like a, what's outside the window. So I make myself think that it's just a part of a scenery. Would it help? Thank you very much. And how to maintain a no mind state? Any tips? In my case, For example, if I have some concern or anxiety, for example,、uh, my job or work have been influenced by,、uh, impacted by COVID 19 and start to feel anxiety, then I start to make or start work even harder. Then naturally, you will see better results. And when you are really, really dedicated, dedicate yourself and、uh, make all out efforts, then you are in a no state of mind. When you are really focusing on just working hard, then、uh, if you feel anxiety or concern, then、uh, focus on working harder, and that will help you to reach the no mind state. But、uh, no mind state, may, you may feel that、uh, you. Lose a sense of humanity or existence. So, no mind doesn't mean no existence. So, like I mentioned, to pay attention to everything around you and focus on the present. So, it doesn't, I don't feel like、uh, I don't exist. I rather think that uh, uh, no mind state often helps or brings a positive feeling, like、uh, I. Can help, I'm helping someone else and so on. And for the people in the modern world, how we can train our mind? Maybe that person has no experience of martial arts. Am I right? If that is the case, then、uh, the simplest question is the exercise or the physical activity, because、uh, the physical well being is. Connected to the mental well being. What kind of exercise? Sport gym would be okay. If you're on a treadmill, then you get out of breath. And if you、uh, have some trouble in a school, then you just run and you become out of breath. Then all those negative feelings go e s away. And that is the no mind state. And liberate yourself from all the worries or negative feelings. So, 
try to focus on some kind of activity, or it can be an exercise, or a game, or a reading book, to keep yourself away from something that sways your emotions. Thank you very much. Any other questions? No more questions. Ebi Sawasan, thank you so much for your presentation. And uh, this brings us to the end of the uh, part three. And f from 10 past six, we would like to start uh, part four, live performance of Naginata. So stay tuned. Thank you very much.
18:10 分となりました。皆様お戻り。So it's ten past six. Welcome back. Now we will start with the part four. Then in movement, Nagisawa performance, Ms. Ebisawa、uh, will be、um, doing the demonstration, and also Mr. Ban Ebisawa, her father, will also be joining. So, Ebisawa, s o n over to you. Hello. So, what we just did was、uh, called Ishinru, Ishin School of Naginata, very traditional martial arts. And Ishinru Naginata, Ishin School Naginata uses this、uh, Naginata, a Japanese h a r d w a r e Uh, to uh, do a demonstration. Maybe it's the first time for you to see this、um, Naginata. But for Naginata, this, the blade is t a long blade. And the shaft is long. And blade with long shaft is Naginata. You can understand that way. And as Mr. Awada explained,、uh, the battles in early modern times. Uh, Naginata was not often used anymore because of the introduction of the firearms and、uh, spears. But before that,、uh, before that time, this was a main weapon in the battlefield. And how do we use it? I just、um, did a demonstration with my daughter, Sword versus Naginata, but in the group battle during the actual battle. This is how you will hold it. 
and you sweep the legs of a horse. Then the, the horse, uh, when uh, the horse falls, then the uh, summer on the horse will fall from the horse, and then you do like this. So sweep in Japanese nagiru or swing. So in Japanese is nagiru. So that's where this uh, name naginata came from, where it's long sword. So it's called naginata. And it's quite a convenient one. And this could cut as a sword. And also this site is called Ishizuki, the butt end of the naginata. It's made of wood, but the, the butt end, you hold it like this and you can either swing or thrust the opponent. You can also do this technique or you can receive the opponent technique. And also I, uh, we just performed Ishinru Naginata. The main technique of Naginata is called Kuruma, which is this one. And the opponent. Groin is the um, attacking point, this area. Uh, maybe I shouldn't, I don't need to explain this area of the opponent's body. And from the bottom, you uh, uh, swing it upwards. So uh, this is one of the uh, main techniques of Ishin Ryu Naginata. And another characteristic of uh, Naginata, it's, it's long. So the opponent, uh, uh, in case of person to person, Sune or Shin, Excuse me. And this is a naginata for a competitive match. It's made of bamboo. And then we both wear protective armors and we strike each other. And you sweep away the opponent's leg like this. You cut or you change hands and cut. In Naginata, the comp in competitive match, we often attack the shin of the, of the opponent. And also this uh, tip or butt end called Ishizuki, uh, you use it to thrust. And also you uh, strike at the uh, face mask or doll or torso. So as a competitive sport, this uh, uh, so-called modern naginata disseminated uh, this uh, sport naginata. And I, in my case, I use uh, uh, this uh, kind of uh, naginata and the one made of oak to do demonstration. And the uh, guests for today. So earlier during the presentation, I talked about mushin or no mind and how do we train or practice mushin. Today, we have wonderful guests. Please come over here. Matsunaga-san is here with me. Thank you for joining me. Have you um, done any martial arts? No, no, no experience at all. How old are you, if I may ask? I am 31 years old. So first and time to experience martial art at the age of 31. Yes, don't be nervous, enjoy. So first, the basic use of naginata. Maybe my father can uh, teach and I can explain. So let's uh, practice kamae or posture. 
Uh, you're Japanese? Yes, he's Japanese. He can speak in Japanese. The so this is the basic posture or kamae of naginata. That's what they're practicing. So rear foot to the front and strike. This is the basic uh, move. You have to hit me, you have to strike me. Your enemy is right here. That's right. And stop it right there. Otherwise, uh, the opponent will strike you at the back of your head. Yes, very good. Good, very good. Continue. And let's vocalize. Uh, we say men. So next, next, uh, let's uh, practice the vocalization. So when you do men uchi or when you strike them at uh, face mask, you say men the moment that you strike, like this. Why vocalization is important for samurai when uh, they are in the battlefield. If you're not loud enough, uh, the, uh, the your members, the other soldiers cannot uh, hear you what you ordered. Otherwise, your um, armies uh, will die if they don't understand the sign. Is, are you loud enough? Can your opponent hear? Very good, louder. Louder, louder. Good. Next, shin or sune. So same, swing and strike at the shin or sune. Hold it up and swing. And then this part of the leg, shin, so it's in sune in Japanese, so when you strike, say sh sune. But again, you are applying unnecessary forces. And if that continues during the competitive match, you cannot. Uh, you run of breath. So be agile and loud and uh, get rid of all the unnecessary power. You still are applying an unnecessary force on your arm. Good. And then Matsunaga-san, uh, your mind is sticking to uh, this uh, fact that you have to strike at the sune or shin, so don't look at it, my shin. Very good. More lightly. Your mind is troubled and you, you are applying unnecessary lateral power. Yes. Okay. Now, Matsunaga-san, you are now ready to attack using uh, men and sune. So let's practice what happens in the battlefield. And you can get advice from my father.
When I do this, then hit my shin. If I do this posture, then um, hit men. But you don't know whichever comes. So. Don't step back. You should keep moving forward. Keep attacking. Shout louder. Keep moving, keep attacking. Don't stop. Men. Yes, that's very good. Then let's do in sequence. You use too much power. Louder. Very good. Very good. Loosen up. Very good. Very good. Yeah, very good. Louder. That's good. Then from different angle. Or different direction, very good. Next. This is men. Keep moving. Men, last one. Don't stop, don't stop. Keep moving, shin. Good. Men. Keep moving, shin, shin, once again, very good, stop, come back here, and take this posture. Thank you very much, and now, Let's ask Matsunaga-san how he felt. So it was really, really difficult to hit face guard men than I thought. You felt some nervousness or what you were doing, how did you feel while you were doing? At the beginning, I was very, very nervous, but uh, while I was doing, I kept focusing on using my naginata and hit as stored. And now you are in the state of no mind. You are really, really focusing on what you need to do right now. So you didn't think about anything else, like uh, I have to wake up early tomorrow morning and so on. So you don't need to do martial arts. It n doesn't necessarily be martial arts. So it can be just go to the gym and do exercise on a, a run, on a treadmill, and so on. Just keep focusing on and uh, do something to the full. Then you will be reaching to this state, no mind state. What We have one minute left. So maybe... We should start taking questions. Understood? Are there any questions? We are having some questions. That's great. Then let's get on to the Q&A. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ban Ebisawa and Ms. Ran Ebisawa and Matsunaga-san. Let's move on to the Q&A session. You can post your questions to the chat section of YouTube. Let me pick up some we've already received. Firstly, 
How many schools of Nagata are there in Japan? Do you know? It has a long history, and、uh, many of them have already terminated or disappeared. So, if we count all of them who used to exist, then it could be hundreds. Thank you. And any characteristics, techniques of、uh, Ishin school?、Uh, one of the main characteristics is、uh, very simple, and it's called Otoko Naginata or Meu Naginata, alternatively. And、uh, I'm going to show you. So. Spread your leg like this, and、uh, it's very down to earth. And the reasons being that、uh, Naginata is very, very heavy, so it's not easy to move around. So you have to stand very firm, and、uh, you need to take this posture to move around this Naginata. And、uh, actually, you use a naginata at the battlefield, so you don't have time to practice, for example,、uh, the enemies attacking the castle. Then you have no time to practice naginata, so it has to be very simple, like this. With these very simple moves, keep attacking the enemy. That is、uh, the characteristic of Ishin school. And there are many other schools, and I'm not、uh, criticizing, but the samurai of that samurai era, then it was like、uh, the school of Naginata to earn income. So it was another reason to keep it. The reasons being, other schools are not so simple, is because、uh, to keep it complex, then they can get、uh, practitioners in their schools and、uh, keep them longer. But、uh, Ishin school is very, very pragmatic and、uh, focusing on the actual battlefield or combat. And you say that.、Uh, Meu Naginata, Otoko Naginata is uh, the uh, alternative name of、uh, Ishin school. But how about the female practitioner of Naginata? And when you look at、uh, the historical drama, then you may often see that、uh, the、uh, maids of the castle, in the cases of crisis or emergency, female took the Uh, naginata, but、uh, Naginata is very dynamic in movements. So, in the group battle, then、uh, you might mistakenly kill, you could have been killed your、uh, peer or comrade with Naginata because it's very long. So, if you're、uh, f i g h t Combating in a group, then this is too long. But this was very useful to defend the castle. So it was a very good weapon for female because、uh, you can keep a distance when you combat. And one thing I like to add is that on a TV or in a film, the maze in the castle. Running with having、uh, naginata in their hands. But please think that、uh, the Japanese houses were much, the ceilings were much lower, so this was too long and、uh, it was unrealistic to move around a naginata inside the house. And it was for self defense and not for the combat inside or indoor. So, Naginata is more suitable for outdoor combat, but this is very convenient and can be used in many ways. So, the monks or the doctors or the maids of the castles were also 
also used Naginata and became one of the mainstream for the uh, weapon for women. Now time is up and uh, we'd like to end the Q&A session. Uh, Mr. Ebisawa and Ms. Ebisawa, thank you so much. With that, we'd like to conclude the, the 53rd Cross-Cultural Seminar. And lastly, we'd like to express our utmost gratitude to the presenters and the demonstrators. So please give big hands to Owada-san and uh, Mr. and uh, Ms. Ban. Thank you very much. And lastly, um, we have a survey open up. So if you could participate, then uh, that would be very helpful. You can find uh, the section in YouTube. Thank you so much for watching. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again in the next session.